Hello and welcome uh, everyone to the Diabetes Management and Oral Health Among Older Adults Experiencing Homelessness. My name is Pascal Leon. I'm with uh, CSH uh, and I will serve as one of your moderators for today's webinar. Uh, I want to start on time as we have a really exciting lineup of uh, presenters. Um, and so while we are uh, waiting for folks to join, um, I just want to uh, get a sense of who's on the phone, if you could just say kind of hello and where you're from. I'll start and just share hello from New York City. And so just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, your phones have all been muted to avoid any unwanted uh, background noise. Uh, and we are recording today's session, so both the slide deck and uh, the recording will be available to you for on-demand viewing at a later time. Um, please use the chat box feature. So if you hold, hover over your screen um, it, towards the bottom in the center, there should be an icon, which is the fourth from the left, that has a uh, chat box feature. Uh, so feel free to enter any questions as we go along today that you may have. Hello from Boston and New York and LA, thank you so much. Uh, feel free to use the chat box feature. Open it up by clicking that icon to type any questions you have. We may be able to take any burning uh, questions in between presenters um, as we go forward. And hello Chicago and Wisconsin. And so um, a little bit about us, um, as I mentioned, uh, I am Pascal Leone, I'm with CSH, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, and it's our mission to advance housing solutions that deliver three powerful outcomes. One, to improve the lives of the most vulnerable individuals and families, two, to maximize public and private resources, and three, to build strong and healthy and equitable communities across the country. And we do this by offering capital, expertise, information, and innovation that allows our partners to use supportive housing to achieve stability, strength, and success for those who are most in need. Um, I want to then invite our partners on this webinar to tell you a little bit about um, their center. Hi, everyone. This is Christine Reedy and Ariel Mather from the National Center for Equitable Care for Elders. And uh, we are a more recent NCA of all of our NCA uh, collaborators. Our particular focus is on increasing the number of older adults served by health centers such as yourselves and decreasing the percent of older adult patients with type 1 diabetes as well as to increase health centers with services that address the social determinants of health. And this, of course, includes housing and, uh, and food insecurity. And so we, um, we have a lot of overlap with today's talk in that uh, our focus is older adults and um, coming from the uh, Harvard School of Dental Medicine, we're also very interested in oral health as well. Thank you, Dr. Reedy. And so I'm really excited to introduce our theme panel. Uh, we have uh, first up uh, Natalie Terrence, who is the Director of Population Health at the Trenton Health Team. Uh, previously, Natalie served as the Performance Improvement Project Manager at Union Health Center in New York City and worked with women, infants, and children in the WIC program at Public Health Solutions. Joining Natalie is Ernie Morgenstern, who is the Senior Director of Population Health at Trenton Health Team. Ernie has over 30 years of experience in home and community-based care, including time as a paramedic in New York City and many years in home care, hospice, and complex care management. Following Ernie will be Carol Nifarados, who is the Director of Dental Services at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Um, after a career of private practice, Carol began in community health clinics as a volunteer uh, and finding that community health centers are the most rewarding career, she dedicated herself to a full-time position providing 13 years of service and leadership in underserved rural and urban areas of Colorado. As the dental director of Colorado Coalition for the Homeless in Denver, uh, she's more than tripled the size of the department in just three years passionately advocating for the dental needs of the homeless. 
Um, as I mentioned, I am Pascal Leone. I'm the Associate Director for a co um, co Corporation for Supportive Housing, CSH's Metro team, serving New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. And I work on initiatives to expand access to supportive housing for vulnerable populations with complex care needs. Um, one of the other moderators uh, is Arielle Mather, who's the program manager at the National Center for Equitable Care for the Elders, Oral Health Policy and Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, where she oversees the planning and the delivery of the center's trainings and technical assistance activities. She spent many years in Boston uh, at the nonprofit sector addressing the needs of older and vulnerable populations, as well as the pro uh, providers who care for them. And last but not least is Dr. Christine Reedy, who's the principal investigator at the center and the Delta, De Delta Dental of Massachusetts Associate Professor in Oral Public Health and Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Reedy oversees the development of the training and the technical assistant modules, the testing with learning collaboratives, and plans for dissemination. So I told you we did have a great lineup, and I am not lying. <laughs> um, just to talk about the aims of this webinar, um, uh, we hope that you leave with a better understanding of the housing and health challenges that older adults 50 years of age and older ex uh, experiencing homelessness face, uh, the role of access to quality oral health care and chronic disease management, and you're able to describe promising and evidence-based practices aimed at improving overall dentition among older adults with diabetes who are homeless or formerly homeless. I want to mention that there will be an accompanying uh, corresponding issue brief that will be released shortly that will be emailed to everyone who registered for this webinar uh, with the promising and evidence-based practices that will be uh, discussed during today's webinar. Um, it also can be found on CSH's website and through our listserv if you're signed up on Homefront as well as Harvard Center uh, is listserv. So definitely stay tuned for that. And so I'm going to quickly and just start us off and, and provide some context on the vulnerabilities of homeless older adults uh, before I turn it over to my colleagues at the center who will do a little bit more of a deeper dive on the burden of diabetes and periodontal disease among this group. And so I'm sure you probably all heard uh, about the graying of America or the senior tsunami or whatever idiom, idiom that is most current today, uh, but essentially the general population in this country is aging. The median age is growing, and so while we're witnessing this increase in lifespan, we're also seeing a decline in birth rates. Um, and this population trend is almost exclusively driven by the baby, baby boomer generation. These are folks who are born between 19 1945 to 1965, and in fact, in 2011, uh, where the oldest post-World War II baby boomer uh, population began turning 65, roughly every single day since 2011, 10,000 boomers turn 65 each day. And so this is being described as a cohort effect or a cohort phenomenon. And by 2030, the 65 and older population would actually increase to 20%, so nearly one in five um, individuals in this country would be over the age of 65, um, and which I find interesting, in 2033, uh, the 65 and older age group would actually outnumber the 18 and younger population for the first time in this nation's history. Uh, and so while folks, you know, it's great that they're living longer, um, there's a certain subset that are living longer, they're getting poorer and having worsening health outcomes. And so adults over the age of 50, as many of you may know, tend to uh, continue to be the most housing cost burden nationally, with about a, a one-third of adults age 50 and older who pay more than 30% of their income for housing that may or may not fit their needs. So naturally, as the aging population has grown, so has the homeless population. And so I like this visual as it, as it really uh, demonstrates how the baby boomer generation has consistently for the last three decades made up one-third of the total homeless population in this country. So what does this all mean in terms of health and aging and homelessness? 
And we know that homelessness and health are intimately interwoven. Poor health is both a cause and a result of homelessness. And so not only are those on the streets getting older, but their health is deteriorating at a, a much faster rate and leading to accelerated aging. So when it comes to homeless older adults, it's more of an issue of functional age rather than chronological. And so as a result, researchers really have focused on the 50 and older when describing older homeless adults. Uh, and we know that age is a well-known risk factor for many chronic diseases, including diabetes. And so homeless older adults have rates of chronic con uh, conditions like diabetes in middle age, in 40s and 50s, that are comparable to those who are several decades older than them. Um, homeless adults over 50 with diabetes are at increased risk of periodontal disease and poor de dentition, which may affect overall health, functional status, and quality of life. Rates of geriatric syndromes, such as cognitive and functional impairments, incontinence, falls, delirium, are similar to those who are homeless age 50 to those who are age 70 plus in the general population. And so for homeless older adults with diabetes, management of their disease unfortunately has to take a back seat to some of the more immediate and pressing concerns such as finding food and shelter and years of attending to these basic survival needs have really outpaced prioritizing their acute and chronic conditions. And so I thought it would be helpful just to kind of talk about um, the pathways uh, to homelessness and so until very recent, I think very little was known about the pathways into homelessness for those who are 50 and older. But thanks to researchers such as Dr. Rebecca Brown and Dr. Margot Cruchel, uh, who have examined the life course experiences and the current vulnerabilities of older homeless adults and found that older homeless adults who become homeless before 50 tend to have more adverse experiences, such as adverse childhood, childhood events, mental health disorders, substance use disorders, histories of imprisonment, and low attainment of adult milestones, such as getting married or having full-time kind of uh, consistent employment. Uh, research in cities such as Oakland and New York City have found that actually one in two and one in three respectively of uh, those who are homeless uh, for the first time um, become homeless for the first time, rather, after age 50. So studies out in Oakland found that one in two of the 50 and older homeless population were homeless for the first time, and in New York City, that was one in three. Some of their attributing factors for first-time uh, homelessness post-50 include long stretches of unemployment, underemployment, history of low wage and unskilled labor, a health crisis experienced by themselves or a partner. Uh, they found that death of a spouse or a parent could lead to homeless, homelessness. Um, so the, we thought it would just be helpful to kind of lay the, the groundwork and understanding the paths that folks have um, into housing instability. And we know that housing, um, accessible and affordable housing, is really the solution to homelessness, right? But when, you, when it comes to housing options for older adults, uh, we know there's a significant range. Um, and while this slide is a little bit busy, uh, I thought it'd be helpful to look at the continuum of housing options um, for older adults, which are largely dependent on their level of service needs and, um, and uh, affordability of housing, right? And so this kind of hierarchy of needs pyramid illustrates that the f kind of the farther up you go, you'll see that there's a deeper need for not only um, services as a graduated service need, but also a deeper rental subsidy need. Um, so the folks, um, the higher you go, uh, when you think about boarding care and assisted living, a nursing home, these are folks who are, who are, te who are not living in independent housing and may need more supports for things like activities of daily living. And so for those of us who work in supportive housing, we know that particularly for folks who have behavioral health challenges, experiences with homelessness, that nursing homes oftentimes are not the best situation for them. Uh, and supportive housing tends to be, and researchers have found it to be a proven effective intervention to prevent uh, premature placement into these really uh, dependent and institutional settings. Um, 
And for folks who are not as familiar with supportive housing, um, it is a proven intervention that reduces the use of emergency services that result in really significant savings in public dollars while providing the coordination of not only physical but behavioral health services that are essential for older homeless adults, formerly homeless adults. Uh, supportive housing also reduces the likelihood that homelessness um, well, the homeless individuals, as I mentioned, will be placed in these institutional settings. Um, and, and quickly, uh, supportive housing is basically uh, affordable housing where individuals pay no more than 30% of their income towards um, uh, rent or utilities, uh, but it also provided with comprehensive wraparound support services to help them maintain uh, stability. Um, and just given the flexibility of the model and the adaptability of the model to really modulate services as folks, you know, have acute need or in terms of crisis, really makes it a really um, adaptable and uh, um, really flexible, particularly for older adults. Um, who um, may have more of that range. And so uh, for just a quick definition of defining supportive housing, you know, it, it targets those who are homeless, at risk of homelessness, exiting institutions uh, with significant challenges such as behavioral health challenges or uh, significant chronic health conditions. Um, it's independent housing, uh, you know, treats tenants in, just like any other tenant in any building uh, with a lease or a sublease agreement. As I mentioned, it's affordable. Folks don't pay more than uh, the 30% of their income towards housing. Um, they have uh, service providers who provide a variety of techniques such as motivational interviewing to engage tenants and services, and it brings key project partners and community partners together uh, to help tenants achieve their goals. And it really supports tenants in being an integral part uh, and connected in part of their communities. And I think the focus on particularly older adults, it thriving and aging in place is really key, um, as particularly for folks um, who have histories of uh, social um, isolation or exclusion uh, based on a number of different life circumstances. And so um, I wanted just to provide that context and then now I'll happily switch it over to our colleagues um, Ariel to talk a little bit more about um, diabetes, the connection of diabetes and periodontal disease. Thanks, Pascal. Yeah, I'm going to very quickly go through some of these slides so we can get to um, our case studies, but wanting just to shift to talk about two other concerns facing older adults, particularly those who are experiencing homelessness, which are diabetes and periodontal disease and their relationship to each other. So you can see in general that diabetes is a major health concern in the United States. Um, often shortening the lifespan of the, those older adults who have it. You can see on the slide that many do not survive past age 85. Um, those living with diabetes often experience weakened immune systems, which makes them more prone to developing infections. And we can see here sort of the first half of this bidirectional relationship with periodontal disease. Um, on the other side, for those who have periodontal disease, which involves infections around the teeth, it actually makes it more difficult for the body to keep blood sugar at a normal level. Um, so each affects each other. Periodontal disease has a major impact on an older adult's quality of life as it affects the integrity of the gums, leading to anything like swelling, soreness, loose teeth, and that's gonna impair their nutritional status. Certainly all of these effects worsen over time. And interventions for periodontal disease usually involve multiple cleanings and medications, which would really require an individual to receive not just a single treatment, but consistent ongoing care, which can be a challenge for those adults experiencing homelessness. Can we go to the next slide? Great, thank you. Um, and there are certainly many barriers to good oral health for those individuals experiencing homelessness, whether it's the lack of access to professional care, the difficulties of self-care, um, whether it's finding clean water, uh, a place to go to do that care, uh, healthy and regular food consumption, medication adherence, and low stress are the key to successful diabetes management. But without a home, um, a person experiencing homelessness, it, it really limits their ability to achieve these factors due to really a variety of uncontrollable circumstances. Uh, these individuals uh, may have more decayed teeth and suffer from even more tooth loss than the general population and even those living in poverty. And due to their living situation, economic situation, lack of access to regular oral care, 
uh, individuals experiencing homelessness are faced with limited options and often resort to having teeth extracted. Next slide. All right. Um, and really, these circumstances often cause a ripple effect. Uh, so when it's difficult to eat or find the necessary healthy food required to control blood sugar levels, someone might opt for soft, easier foods to eat like jello or pudding, or they may not have control over how many times a day they can eat or at what time. This definitely contributes to the bi-directional relationship with diabetes um, as high blood sugar levels over time will increase the risk of health complications and really make management more complicated. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide because we can see even from that short overview that managing diabetes and oral health while experiencing homelessness is challenging and impacts overall health and quality of life. But we really want to focus on today are some of our promising practices specifically from sites in New Jersey and Colorado. We're excited to hear more about how community-based providers have thought to innovatively address oral health-related complications among older adults with housing instability. And with that, I'm going to let our first presenters from the Trenton Health team take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Natalie Perrins with the Trenton Health team, and I'm here with my colleague, Ernie Morgenstern. Um, so we're going to walk you through a little bit about our, um, who we are as an organization and our approach to addressing the social determinants of health. So just a, a few words about our origin story and where we're going as an organization, which I think is important. Um, like many community-based organizations like ours, uh, we emerged out of crisis. That crisis was uh, in the early 2000s when one of three, uh, actually two, uh, acute care hospitals here in Trenton, New Jersey um, was slated for closure. Uh, the mayor convened uh, a blue ribbon panel and essentially said, what do we do about this? Uh, we're losing an acute care hospital to the suburbs. Um, and what emerged was, uh, was the Trenton Health Team. So the CATS report uh, in, uh, in 2006 uh, sort of gave us our early charge, which was talking about integrating uh, healthcare delivery um, improving access and funding for specialty care, um, really connecting with community members where they are uh, with engagement strategies and ongoing plans for that. Um, central to this work was the establishing of a health database, uh, a health information exchange, which uh, Natalie will speak about in a few moments, um, expanded access to primary care, um, ultimately looking to improve um, key measures of public health. Um, our four, we call them our founding partners, uh, are the two acute care hospitals in, uh, in Trenton, uh, our sole federally qualified health center, um, and the city of Trenton's Department of uh, Health and Human Services. So our, our community uh, is uh, a small one. We're the capital of the state of New Jersey. Um, we're right across the river, uh, the Delaware River from Pennsylvania. Uh, we have just over 84,000 um, members of the community. Uh, we're a majority minority community with more than 50% African American um, and an underrepresented 34% Hispanic. So that's clearly understated. Um, 25 plus percent living in poverty. Uh, with significant uh, disparities and inequities um, in both violence rates, uh, disease burden, um, and, uh, and poverty levels from the rest of the state of New Jersey. Um, you see the slide on the, uh, on the right. <clears throat> it's a vivid representation of our sort of um, uh, health geography. So the bottom number, 73 years on the bottom left, represents the life expectancy uh, at the time for an average resident of, uh, of Trenton, whereas the number uh, in the top right, 87, uh, represents a 13-year difference in life expectancy for people that are located just about 14 miles up U.S. Highway 1. Um, so significant disparity and, and inequities that we're looking to, uh, to work with. So see on the bottom, 
uh, disease prevalence for hypertension, diabetes, and clinical obesity um, significantly above state and national rates. So we came together um, multiple times over the past 13 years uh, to talk with our community about what we wanted to do as far as health. Um, so we came up with this uh, vision. So what this, uh, this vision speaks to is what we would like someone born today to experience when they graduate high school 17 or 18 years from now. Uh, so we want uh, a healthy environment where people can live, learn, uh, live, work, learn, and play. Uh, a growing economy with stable businesses and tax bases. People are earning more money. There are better employment opportunities. The middle class is growing. People are emerging out of the poverty that they're struck with now. Um, there are clean, green, accessible public spaces. Um, our waterfront is accessible and inviting. Um, we have a continued strong, vibrant, proud community leveraging its history, um, something that exists now but can only be enhanced. Um, education is more effective, uh, as shown with rising graduation rates, um, better jobs, uh, and increased community engagement. Uh, one key focus uh, that we'll speak about later is healthy food, uh, available everywhere in retail establishments as well as within schools and at home, leveraging urban agriculture. Trenton is an urban community um, nestled in the middle of rolling farmlands in Mercer County in New Jersey. Um, obviously, improved safety is extremely important um, uh, with reductions in gangs and gun violence uh, of key importance, and ultimately, quality health care uh, that's people-centered, integrated, and accessible. And these are things um, that we're particularly interested in, uh, in supporting. So we, we received a, a grant from the Merck Foundation uh, in 2017 to improve the health of patients with diabetes uh, in Trenton. Um, this is a five-year grant, and we're currently in the beginning of year three. Um, so the grant initiative is called Bridging the Gap. Um, in a little bit, I'll send out a link to the website. Um, they are currently funding, this is the second cohort, eight grantees across the country with uh, varying geographies and populations. Um, but all of the uh, grantees are working to um, evolve um, clinical care to improve health outcomes for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, and to really look at the social determinants of health and how partnerships between sectors can improve care for the population. Um, this is our, so Capital City Diabetes Collaborative is what we call our Merck Foundation grant here. Um, so we're work, really working in three different areas. Um, one is clinical transformation, so looking at standardized patient education materials for diabetes. Uh, we are working with a multidisciplinary group of clinicians um, that work at multiple different institutions in Trenton. So we gather monthly and are you know, in communication over email to kind of figure out what the standard of care is for patients with diabetes in Trenton. So we've taken the ADA guidelines and ex our experience in working with patients in the city and have created a, a standardized care pathway that three different healthcare institutions, our two hospitals and our federally qualified health center have all formally uh, adapted. Um, we've also placed um, digital retinal exam equipment uh, using the IRIS software in primary care so patients can kind of go to their primary care doctor and have a one-stop shop for a retinal screening. They don't have to go to another, um, another practice. And we're also working with Project um, ECHO. This is a, um, a video conferencing educational um, intervention for providers to increase their uh, knowledge, skill, and self-efficacy in caring for patients with diabetes. And because we're in an environment that has a limited um, endocrinology providers to accept Medicaid, this is particularly important to um, be able to have um, to really keep the endocrinology business for those who need them the most and kind of increase capacity within the primary care setting. Um, we also will talk a little bit more in a minute about our care management team and the work that we're doing with community health workers in 
um, finding patients with diabetes in community-based settings and working with them to address um, their healthcare concerns and their um, social needs or non-medical needs. Um, we've worked with a lot of different self-management um, education programs. We've worked with Inquisit Health, a telephone-based peer mentoring program for people with diabetes. And more recently, we've been um, implementing Project Dulce, which is um, a peer-led uh, diabetes education program that we're starting um, to implement in community-based settings like soup kitchens, um, residential housing uh, buildings, churches, places in the community that people already are, um, and having those places be a connection point into healthcare rather than asking patients to come to the clinic for more education. Um, we're, we're kind of building up this, this resource within community-based settings and kind of meeting people where they are. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, NowPow, it's a social service track referral platform that also has um, an updated resource directory where clinicians, um, healthcare providers in the healthcare setting, but also those who work at food pantries, who work at homeless shelters can screen patients for um, social needs and then um, generate a healthy prescription, a, pre a healthy Rx, which is a prescription for social services for that patient based on the social needs that are identified, and then generate track referrals to another organization. Um, we're looking at in trends to increase access to healthy and affordable foods. Um, we're working on building a food co-op, which we're still probably a few years down the line from opening. We also have a produce voucher program where clinicians can give um, vouchers to patients that they can use at the farmer's market. So we're focusing on giving those vouchers to people who have diabetes. Um, so we, we also operate, in addition to being a multi-sector healthcare collaborative, um, we operate a health information exchange that um, deeply informs a lot of the, the programmatic work that we do. Uh, we are um, a Medicaid ACO. More recently, the, the legislation has shifted to a regional health hub. So we receive Medicaid claims data, and we also have clinical data from um, healthcare institutions in the area. So we have records for about um, 600,000 patients. So within our HIE, um, Care Evolution is the vendor, we have aggregated a unified patient record that includes um, claims and clinical data. Um, and we also have a population health um, analytics engine where we can look at clinical and claims data and um, in the near future, we'll be able to look at social determinants of health data um, to, you know, if you can imagine we're going to be looking at, um, you know, patients with diabetes who report housing concerns and oral health needs, and we can kind of find, segment that population and tailor interventions directly to them. Um, so to give you a little bit of a sense of how our health information exchange works, um, we're able to um, pull different groups of, of patients um, in our um, regional population, and we've stratified the patients with diabetes and Trenton to be able to better tailor interventions um, and resources. Um, care management. So speaking about resources, um, one of the first resources we developed as Trenton Health Team was a uh, small but mighty, as I like to describe them, um, care management team. Um, so we'll go, uh, we'll go through for a few minutes on um, how that's set up and how that intervention is, uh, is delivered in this context and, and also more broadly. Um, so we have funding from a number of different sources as well as referral sources um, from a number of different places um, that work down this funnel. So we get um, direct referrals from providers in the community uh, either our uh, our core partners or otherwise. Um, we work with priority populations. Um, one that we've been talking about extensively in this context has been diabetes, um, but we also have um, uh, folks undergoing cancer treatment um, and a number of other um, priority populations we work with. Uh, we're currently intensifying our screening activities in the community. Um, 
in increasing both the volume of screenings that we provide directly and through our partners, um, as well as the number of different conditions that we're screening for. Uh, and lastly, we're contracted with uh, actually now two managed care organizations um, to provide in-person care management um, to their beneficiaries in the Trenton area. Um, so once these folks are identified, uh, often using uh, data from our health information exchange, um, they are then outreached to uh, and gain consent and they enroll. Uh, and once they enroll, we can have the next slide. Um, we have a small interdisciplinary team that works with them. Um, so focusing on uh, the most important piece uh, is the bottom right, the community health worker. Um, you'll see why that, uh, that arrow is a little bit uh, different appearing than the other ones. Other ones. That's the key piece, that's the core relationship between that client or patient and the team is the community health worker. Um, it's a one-to-one -one relationship um, that really is built on strong relationship and trust. Um, we uh, select these folks uh, and we only have three or we'll be expanding our team to five uh, in the next several weeks. Um, their job uh, is to locate clients out in the community, um, conduct social determinant screening, um, refer folks that have needs and then follow up with them. But they're also teaching self-management skills, um, both education, goal setting and follow up using motivational interviewing um, and patient activation measure. Uh, a big piece of what they do is navigating clients uh, to care, both primary care um, as, well, uh, as well as specialty care. Uh, including, um, you know, endocrinology uh, and, and dental care where it's uh, identified as a need and we'll talk about our screening process in a few minutes. Uh, the key piece here is these folks are uh, of the community, from the community. Uh, they either still live in, in the Trenton community or have very close ties uh, to Trenton. Um, oftentimes they know most of the clients that they're coming in contact with. Uh, they've gone to school with them. Their mother goes to church with the client's mother. Um, so there are strong personal connections that are built. So that's really the key piece. Um, but we also have uh, a nurse care manager who both acts as operational leadership for the group, um, but also does traditional nursing. Now, the important thing to take away here is our intervention, um, while it, it's populated by uh, skilled nursing and social worker staff, and capabilities. It's really focused on community health worker intervention, specifically around the social determinants of health. Um, so our nurse does uh, clinical and medical assessment, um, as well as uh, participates in the social assessment, uh, does medication reconciliation, and advocates with providers. She's not doing skilled hands-on nursing like wound care um, and things like that but rather when those things are indicated, um, she works with other vendors uh, in, in the community to coordinate that care um, best. And lastly, we have uh, an MSW. Um, she, her job is to address specialty social determinants needs um, by client advocacy, um, navigating to and through benefits, particularly around housing and financial assistance and behavioral health. Um, it's important to say in the context of this talk today um, that a significant portion of our patient population and certainly the population of the city here in, in Trenton um, either uh, is homeless, has a history of homelessness, or, um, you know, has active uh, unstable housing issues. Um, because of that, there's a, a large transient population. Um, both within and uh, and inside, uh, into and out of the Trenton population. So housing is a particularly important concern that we uh, we come into um, quite often when working with our clients. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about NowPal, and this is really the way uh, the tool that um, we're implementing right now to provide to 
healthcare staff and also community-based organizations and social service agencies to address a patient's um, or client's full um, needs, including medical and non-medical. Um, so this tool, um, it's a web-based screening tool that can be used on any computer, can be open on the phone or an iPad or tablet as well. Um, the first thing it has is a community resource directory. So they have a, NAPO has a team of individuals who spend all day, every day calling um, organizations in the area um, and confirming that they're open, what, um, what types of insurances they accept, what types of populations they serve, what languages their staff speak, and this resource directory is updated at least twice a year. Um, so this is a huge resource, and we actually have over, um, for a small city that's about seven square miles, we have over 350 nonprofit organizations in the area. Um, so this kind of really opens up um, kind of a scope for um, healthcare uh, clinicians and staff and also those in social service organizations to be able to refer patients when um, other needs are identified. We also developed um, kind of in conjunction with um, social workers at our different healthcare organizations um, and the homeless shelter, we developed a social service, um, a social needs screening tool um, using uh, a mixture of different clinically validated questions. We kind of tailored and selected the social domains that we found were most um, uh, pertinent to the population here in Trenton, and we used our community health needs assessment to identify which what domains those were. Um, so, the, the, the social determinants of health screening um, is meant to be conducted on any patient. It, it kind of it flows pretty quickly. They're mostly yes or no questions, um, and we're in the very early stages of implementing this, and we've already identified. Um, that for many of our um, care management patients, that food insecurity and dental care are among the two um, most important and kind of most prevalent social needs that have been identified. So the, the beauty of this tool is that you can then um, send a track referral to a social service organization or another provider, um, and then you can actually track the outcome of that tool. So we're working to engage different um, community organizations and agencies and providers to be a part of this tool so that they can receive those tracked referrals um, and the person sending the referral can then monitor whether they actually went to the appointment, what the outcomes were without even having to pick up the phone. So it's really a closed loop referral for social services. Um, we, this uh, platform is also integrated into our health information exchange. So like I said, um, kind of our vision here, our working vision is to look at both social conditions and um, clinical diagnoses and utilization together um, to better serve um, the population's health needs here in Trenton. Uh, this is a, kind of an image of our screening tool that I'm happy to share with everyone. Um, we focus, we, we use the Siren resource to look at what tools were already out there. Um, and then we kind of selected um, which questions were relevant to our population. And I think that is it. Um, and I'm going to uh, pass the ball to Carol. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, yes. OK, good. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here with a great presentation so far. My name is Dr. Carol Nivaratos. I'm the Director of Dental Services at Colorado Coalition for the Homeless in Denver, Colorado. Our organization has been around for 40 years, and we are a, a unique model of providing affordable house, housing, housing along with fully integrated health care, which we've expanded greatly in the last four years by building our um, Stout Street Health Center, which was actually built with integration in mind. Um, we have around 2,100 um, units of supportive housing, including three floors above the health center. So the, the health center is in a five-story building. The bottom two floors are health center and health center related, and then the top three floors are affordable housing. So um, we have a very unique approach, a large and diverse organization, 
Um, we have a, an extensive outreach program too, including um, a homeless outreach van that we take out. We'll soon have a second one of those. And one of our um, one of our strategic goals is to keep integration as part of everything we do. So we have a comprehensive approach, and um, we actually have data that shows us how well we're doing with integrating our uh, electronic health record is what was selected with the abil its ability to integrate the various services. So we use the next gen health record, and then we use the QSI dental health record, which is the companion piece of software. It actually has an icon. I, as a dentist, I use the same module for prescribing as does the primary care provider. So we're able to see what each other is prescribing, and that um, creates a much a, a, a higher quality of health care for the patient. There's much more knowledge about the patient. Um, the second floor has the integrated suite, which I have an extensive integrated um, staffing of over 25 people. We have the behavioral health providers, psychiatric providers, peer mentors, case managers, um, a dental hygienist, pri uh, primary care folks, meaning the, the um, nurse practitioners, MDs, DOs, and then we have MAs and support nursing. So um, it, what we found is that homelessness is a complex problem, and it cannot the the needs cannot be even begun to be addressed until we create an integrated staffing where we have full communication and no barriers in our communication to address the barriers of the homeless. Um, so we have found that extremely beneficial. It's very popular with the patients. Our, our new building is um, fully integrated, it's literally a one-stop shop. The patient can receive pharmacy, can get all their pharmaceuticals, their vision care with glasses, their dental, their primary care and wound care, as well as their psychiatric care and their behavioral health care. So it's a huge benefit and we found it to be very popular. This is, um, this is actually a picture of the dental team and the standalone dental clinic in the Stout Street Health Center. We also have a, another standalone dental clinic across the street. It, it's our traditional, traditional clinic that was there, that has been there for many years before this one was open. And then we also have a second floor clinic that um, integrates more fully with the suite based healthcare. Oh, we have case manage, um, extensive case management, too. Our project, um, we started around two years ago. It's, uh, it was funded by the um, Centers for Disease Control with the assistance of Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and um, Colorado Community Health Network, which is our primary care organization for the federally qualified health care centers. Our health center here at Colorado Coalition for the Homeless is an FQHC, and so we, um, we received the support and technical assistance for this project. The project was, um, has been developed so that we could begin to create a process of trackable referrals for patients with diabetes from the dental clinic to the medical clinic and then to, from the medical to the dental clinic. What we had was a warm handoff situation where we tried to um, integrate our diabetes patients that were known diabetics, that already had a diagnosis. We gave them actually a paper card and said, come on over to the primary care, they'll see you, you know, right away or vice versa. The primary care would give um, them a card to go to the dental clinic where they could um, get a dental appointment in the best, best possible case, to be honest, there's no way we can meet the need or the um, demand for dental care. It's a, it's, it's just a tremendous pressure. 
and we do our best to provide a, a strong mixture of urgent care and same-day appointments with um, some also previously scheduled appointments to meet needs. So um, our population of health, health patients across the, the um, entire organization, we have around 10% of our patients that have a diabetes diagnosis diabetes or prediabetes. Of that 10%, and we have around 15,000 patients, unique patients, so around 10% have a diabetes or prediabetes diagnosis. Of that, of that 10%, 30% have uncontrolled A1Cs. And we united as a healthcare team, um, in particular the director level staff, we all felt very, that it was a high priority to improve our care to diabetic patients. And so when I presented this project, which did focus on the oral health care as the driver, I had full um, agreement. Everyone was willing to take on the work, which the work, there's quite a workload in creating trackable referrals through your electronic dental record and electronic medical records just to, even with full integration, the way we have it, it's still, it was still quite a lot of work, months of work, really. It took around nine months to get a workflow established, where, but the result was that we have the ability to use the American Diabetes Risk Assessment at the chair side for patients, for adult patients that come into our clinic that have not had a, a previous diagnosis. We give them the questionnaire from the American Diabetes Association. You can go to it right on the website. We, got, we had that uh, placed on, a, on, on what you could call a live template within our electronic record, health record. Um, each, the dental assistant will work, go through the questions, which include how much do you weigh, how tall are you, do you have a family member um, that has diabetes, are you physically active, um, do, did, you, do, do, did you have gestational diabetes if you were a female? Um, those questions are auto-totaled. The, re the responses to those questions are auto-totaled. And then uh, the link, the, the dental assistant views the risk. If it comes up in red at 5.7 or, or above, then they, the patient is offered a point of care blood test. And um, we use the Alary Affinian right there at the chair side, which is exactly the test that is used in the primary care medical suites. And we are able to assist the patient to get a primary care appointment if they come up at high risk of having prediabetes or diabetes. And so there was a big training piece involved in this. I, I do want to highlight to everyone that we only screen. There is absolutely no discussion of a diagnosis. The patient is informed that um, they are, that, that our screening um, tools have indicated that they are high, at high risk for prediabetes or diabetes and that, um, that they need to be seen by our primary care team to determine whether or not they actually have prediabetes or diabetes and that will include, it will be done by a lab draw, which we do have a lab here in the clinic so the patient can generally receive that information very rapidly. Um, for our older patient population, patients that just in the last 12 months, we had 151 patients that were 60 years of age or over that had the diabetes risk assessment, meaning the verbal questionnaire. And those that came up as high risk were it was 86 of them. And then those that came up with a point of care A1C that had results of uh, 5.7 that indicated a need for referral, there were 44 of them. So that, that um, gives you an idea of the population that, we, that we're seeing right now currently in the last 12 months using this project. Um, I do want to mention that 
the, the diabetes education has been highly impacted by this project. There was um, part of the initiatives in the, the grant were that we would begin work on, the, on becoming National Diabetes Prevention Program certified and diabetes self-management education certified. And so we, we worked on that and um, so many of the dental met team members and the medical team members had education. What we had before was that um, we had a facilities-based diabetes education group that was supported by a behavioral health provider and taught by a single nurse educator. She was the only nurse that knew anything about diabetes with any depth. And um, what we found that this project has truly improved the base of knowledge so that the patient can receive information right there in the exam room. That has just um, created a situation where our patients are far more well informed. I do see that that we might be running out of time a little bit here. Um, but um, the, the education piece, I can't overstate, all the medical providers took the online free education called Smiles for Life. There were three modules that were absolutely required by the, um, the grant project, and that just opened the door for conversations. It created much more common ground and common knowledge between the, the primary care provider staff and then the oral health provider staff, and then the American Diabetes Education Association, which is the online web-based education for, um, from the ADA. That, that created a common ground for our oral health staff to enter into conversations not only with the other primary care staff, but also with the patients that were knowledgeable. We had dental assistants, hygienists um, involved in the education. We also had a diabetes program manager educated through the um, online web-based education. Um, I do want to give a few minutes for questions. I, um, there's a lot more I could say, obviously, but don't, I don't want to take, take all the time. Thanks so much, Carol. Uh, this is Arielle. If you could uh, move the presenting privileges back over to, um, to Christine Reedy, or someone could. Yep, I think we'll move back just one slide just for the briefest moment uh, because we want to just mention that we do have some recommendations, a lot of them that were informed by our case studies and research, I won't read them all right now because I'm hoping that folks have a couple of questions they want to type into the chat box. Um, but you can see in addition to those recommendations on the slide, um, we've also seen that you know, clinics can create bi-directional workflows to assess and screen for oral health and chronic con uh, disease conditions, can leverage health information technology to collect and track patients um, in need of care or biannual dental evaluations, and of course, utilize some of the, the pre-existing uh, educational materials for ongoing staff training, um, some of which Carol just mentioned. Uh, so we have, um, we'll go to the question slide. We only have just a few moments. We have one or two questions in the chat box, um, but if you have any more, feel free to type them. We had a question, um, Christine, can you read the question about the code? Oh yeah, so uh, there was, a uh, question about the um, the D O four one one, and uh, and actually I'll, I I can answer it or or Carol can answer it. It's it's uh, it's a CDT code um, that uh, dental offices can use for point of care diabetes testing. So doing chair side uh, A one C screening. Mm -hmm. I think someone had a question about is there a, is there a corresponding uh, ICD code or, or was that the question that was put in earlier? Yeah, is there an ICD code? Uh, Carol, do you have anything that you can speak to around that? I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Um, yes. So the CDT code, that is a service code. That code is used for reimbursement. In our state, it is re that um, service is reimbursed by Medicaid. 
D0411, and um, this, the, uh, the other code, ICD-10 code, that is a diagnosis code, and we, there is a code, there is a diagnosis code, a service code, but I'm not as familiar with what those numbers are. I'm sure we could get them for you. Okay. Um, and we have another question. Uh, how many point of care devices are available? Was it only being done in the dental department, or what was that workflow like? We, so we started the point of care testing for A1C in our whole health center. Uh, for whatever reason, the primary care weren't doing it, but, but they wanted to. So we use the Alare Affinian. We have one, um, so there's a, the, the way it works is it's kind of a large, a little bit of a, it's a larger piece of equipment. We have one per dental clinic. And then the actual point of care test piece is just a small, almost the size of a glucom, uh, glucose testing. And then you take that, you take a little bit of blood and bring it back to that machine. It gives you the, co the, uh, the um, A1C reading within a couple of minutes. We are at our time, so I don't want to I don't want to keep us any longer. If you have other questions, feel free to email us. You should have been receiving the slides um, and a link to an evaluation survey. There was another question about if you could receive a questionnaire that was mentioned. We'll look into that and make sure that additional resources are sent out. Um, if that makes sense for the groups that shared. Um, Pascal, is there anything else before we say goodbye? No, I just want to all the panelists um, for your great presentation. Thank you everyone for your active participation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. I'm, I'm honored to be part of it. Okay, thank you so much everyone. We'll be in touch. Have a great day. Bye. Thank everyone. You, everyone.